Now in your notes it says this, when you are performance oriented, even your ministry will be messed up. Because that's what Paul's going to talk to us now as we end this chapter off. He, he talks about ministry, about ministry being compromised because of the gospel of due and, and about m- ministers being hypocrites because of the gospel of due. And we're, we're not going to be able to go through all of it today, but I want us to focus in on, on this. In your notes it says, if I'm trying to win God or man's approval, then even godly things I do can be warped by the wrong motivation. See, this is what makes this so hard, is especially at church, and why a church can end up being filled with hypocritical, compromised, legalist people. Because it's not what we do, but it's the thing that moves us or drives us in our heart that really counts. It's not the outward that people see, it's the inward. And, and you can go to a church where they do all the right things, but the energy behind it is to win the approval of man and earn their way up in, in the church's hierarchy and, 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 and get, get, you know, win the approval of God somehow. They're, gonna, they're more spiritual if they did this or if they do that. You can go to a church where they do all the same things, but it's energized out of the gospel of do, or you can come to a place where the energy, where the realization is Jesus Christ has done it all. I can never in any way uh, improve upon what he's done. And these things that I do now, I do them simply as a love response to God. I do them because I want to love him in some kind of way. But you know, it's possible to take spiritual things and do them for all the wrong reasons and get all the weird all the weirdness that many of, us, uh, we, we, many of us have seen over the years. For example, I can take something like evangelism, and rather than doing it out of a heart of love for God and response to God and care for people, I can do it out of a sense of performance. That's what these Judaizers were doing, these people. They were going to, to Galatia so they could report back on the good numbers that they had and the people they got circumcised and all this kind of thing. All at once, evangelism becomes a sales call. And as I'm interacting with people, I see them as prospects that I have to qualify. Do they seem like they've got the potential? I don't love them as a person or anything like that. And if they, if they don't hop on right away to what I want to see happen, I skip them, get on to the next one. I've got to get on to the next one. Why? Because I've got to win some people. I've got to win some people. It's performance. We've got to show what we're doing. And instead of people seeing that love of Jesus Christ, they see this salesman trying to relate to them, trying to win in that way. Even beautiful things like the care connection of our church where, where we're moving in mercy ministries, doing things like going to the open door mission and feeding the homeless and the broken or, or going to Ronald McDonald House and helping families whose children are, 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 are being deeply uh, uh, affected with health issues. Even those things can, be, can come instead of as a love response where I'm loving the Lord back by loving, p- hurting people. Instead of that, it's duty you know, hey, I got to put in my uh, my care connection time. I I got to do my I got to do my duty here. Okay, what do you need? What do you need? You need me to serve food? Serve food? No problem. Plop, 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 you know, hand it out to people. Okay, the hour's over. Hey, thank you. Hey, it was good. It was good. Yeah, good to see what happened again here. I'm out. No love, no care, because the thing that's energizing me is not love for God or love for people. The thing that's energizing me is fulfilling my duty. Winning my place, getting my spot, showing that I did what was necessary for both God and for man. Even spiritual gifts can be affected if the energy behind them is performance. You know, a person prophesies in church, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the prophecy can come forward. And if it's, if, if it's motivated by being seen by men or somehow trying to prove their spirituality, you know, we can find the prophecy is overly dramatic, you know, and its presentation to, it kind of draws attention to itself in that way, and, and maybe it becomes very wordy, you know, because we've got to say everything perfectly and get this whole thing out in such a way that, that you know, that we make a good impression and, and, and that both p- other people see our spirituality, and of course the Lord sees our, uh, our obedience that we did these different kinds of things. And the spirit of performance can infect even something as precious as a spiritual gift. Even something like prayer, Jesus tells us. 
He says, you know, these people, when they pray, they pray out in front of everybody. They pray as a performance. They pray as, a, as an act. See? And, and maybe we've been in meetings before where we've heard people pray and there was something in us that didn't quite register right. And we, we realized that the prayers that they were, that they were, that, that they were praying somehow were, were, were a performance, that somehow they were trying to communicate something about themselves and, and, and not just be in a humble place of interaction and communication with the Lord. And so even these beautiful things, evangelism, Mercy, mercy, caring for others, prophesy, prayer can all become polluted if the energy behind it is me trying to perform, me trying to be good enough, me trying to set my place so people can see where I am instead of having that humility that comes to us when we realize what the cross is really all about. Well, let's... let's Turn in here to these, this last couple of scriptures that we're going to look at in the book of Galatians as we close out this series. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Now, normally when these letters were written, they were written through scribes. Uh, that is, the, the person who was doing this would... You know, those, I've been around a little while. I've actually seen things change over the years on how communication happens. You know, when I first started in the, in the ministry, it was typewriters. You know, but most, I mean, literally, I know there are people in this room that have never seen a typewriter in the flesh, okay? And, uh, I, you know, this was the way you, when you wanted to make an official communication, you used this, this typewriter and you had little invisible stuff you painted over things to cover up your mistakes. And, and this, was the, this was the way you communicated. You know, and then we went to word processing. It's unbelievable. You know, and now email and, and, and instant messaging and, and all these kinds. Of, so, so in my lifetime, I've seen the process of communication. Now, the, the typewriter or the word processor of Paul's age was a scribe. That was just how everybody did it. That's how you communicated when you were going to do that kind of thing. And normally Paul used a scribe, and most of his letters, he might only write the last line or, may, or, or he would write his name with his own hand to show the authenticity of the letter. But in this case, the last paragraph, Paul says, I'm writing this with my own hand right now. And he says, I'm writing it with big letters. This, this is like me saying to you, read the bold. Okay, read the bold print now. I'm giving it to you in bold print. Read it, okay? And this is what, this is what Paul is doing right now. He's taking the end of this letter, and he's saying, I'm giving it to you now. He's making it personal. This whole letter has been very personal, but now he's saying, if you doubted it, I'm writing the last paragraph myself. I'm making it very personal, and I'm making it big. I want you to pay attention, okay? And, uh, and this is where we find ourselves. And he, he speaks to us and he says to us here that legalism causes you to compromise your ministry. And I wish we could go through this whole rest of this chapter, but we won't be able to. But I want us to catch the theme here. Looking at, at verse Galatians 6, 12, he says this. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply so they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. You may wonder what that means, but let, let's break it down a little bit. Try to make a good showing in the flesh by compelling you to be circumcised. Now, Paul understood all about this motivation. Because you remember when Paul was like a rising star in the synagogue, he was like the up-and-coming young buck that was really out there. He had studied under Gamaliel. Everybody thought he was the hot stuff. And not only that, he wanted to be seen as the purest of the pure. So he took it upon himself and rose up and said, I will pursue and extinguish the church of Jesus Christ. And he rose up and he began to go after the believers. The Bible says he literally dragged them from their homes. He threw them into prison. He oversaw uh, believers being stoned to death. Killed right on the spot. And he knew why he did it. Paul did it because other people were looking. And he wanted them to look at him and to say, here was, you know, here's the purest and here's the best that we have. Here's the guy coming up 
This guy is coming up. He is really somebody, see? And he wanted to stand out from among all his peers. And he says, I know all about that. And he he writes about them, and he says, that's exactly what's energizing them. He says, what's energizing them is, is, is they want to make a good showing in the flesh. And they want to compel you to be circumcised. He says, but look at what he says. Simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. He says, you you, you know what's energizing this? He says, they preach this mixed up gospel, this gospel of do, uh, where where, where we have something to do. It's not like they would say, you know, Jesus didn't have any contribution to make. They would say, well, Jesus did his part. He died on the cross. But you got to do your part, too. You have something to do, too. He says, you know why they, 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 they preach like that, why they talk like that? Because if they talk the way I talked, he said, they would be persecuted and they would be rejected because they were taking their stand on the cross of Christ. Now why is, why are they afraid of being persecuted for the cross of Christ? It's because of this. If the cross of Christ was really necessary, it says that man is absolutely, pathetically broken and useless that he has nothing to contribute to the process of salvation. Look look at your notes right here. The cross says that man is a sinner, cursed by God, cursed by God. You know, this isn't what you heard growing up, you know. What you heard growing up is we were made in the image of God and and, you know, all the God's little people all over the world, and God's children are everywhere. You know, this is the image. This is not the image of the Bible. That's, that image right there is great. That will get you a Coke commercial. Okay, all holding hands, you know, sha-na-na. You know, that will get you a Coke commercial. Okay, that's awesome. Nobody's going to persecute you for that view. But the view that Paul is talking about, look, look at here. The cross says that man is a sinner, cursed by God, who can do absolutely nothing to save himself. That man is totally dependent on God's mercy and grace to save him. As a matter of fact, if we were to have some kind of living image right now, and we were to have Jesus Christ publicly portrayed as crucified in front of us, and we were to be here and Jesus would be, would, would, would be nailed and looking down and you were to have the sense like in a 3D movie, like you were literally at the foot of the cross. These are the kinds of things that Jesus might say to you from the cross. I'm here because of you. It's your sin I'm bearing. It's your curse I'm suffering. It is your debt I'm paying. It is your death I'm dying. I am doing this for you because there was absolutely no other way for you to be saved. Do you think Jesus would have gone to the cross, the humiliation of the cross, taken naked and strewn out there and beaten and all the horror that went on? Do you think he would have done that? If you could have solved the problem by buckling down? Do you think he would have been nailed like this if you could have just gotten a little more consistent and gotten things worked out and really kind of, you know, kind of showed God where you were at? Look, Look at this next note. Do you think, Jesus is speaking, do you think my father would have done this to me If you could have saved yourself, do you think God the Father would have taken his son and sent him from the the throne of heaven and brought him down to earth and had him nailed to a cross, born in in a manger, rejected and despised, forsaken of men? Do you think the God of heaven would have done that to his precious son if there was any other way? Do you think if, that he, he would have done that if he would just said, you know, if these people just really got serious, they could, they, could, they could turn this thing around? God sent his son to die on the cross because you and I were absolutely helpless. Look, look in your notes. 
If the cross is necessary, it shows man he is powerless, broken, and pathetically needy. If the cross, was, if the cross wasn't necessary, that's, but if the cross was necessary, it shows that, that it, we in our own strength could do nothing to help ourselves. That all of our righteous deeds truly are filthy rags. But, you know, look here in your notes. If every good thing you have ever done, and I, I want to talk to you now, I'm, I'm talking about, think of the nicest people you know. Think of, of Dick Dreyer. You know, th- think, of, think of Tom Brazell, you know. Think of, think of people that you know that are just absolutely, you know, godly, wholehearted, just awesome. Think of the nicest people you know. Look at this now. If every good thing any of those people or you have ever done and every accomplishment you have ever achieved was stacked up as a ladder to help you reach God, it would look like a three-foot step ladder next to the Empire State Building. I'm talking to, you know, somebody like Dick who is given a lifetime of consecration and holiness and, and, and set his heart to follow the Lord. A man of God, all of his righteous deeds compared to the need that he had would look like a three-foot ladder next to the Empire State Building. He would no way, there would be, he, he, is, he falls so far short, so far short. All of our righteous deeds, everything that we've done, none of it could do it. None of it could help us. None of it could save us. But, you know, I don't, you're not going to win any, you're not going to sell any tapes with a message like that. You know, no CDs, nothing. Nobody's buying your DVDs. It's, who wants a religion like that? You don't want a religion like that. This is the kind of religion you want. You want a religion where God does a little and you do little. That's why you keep your self-respect. This way you, 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 uh, you, know, you show that you're, uh, you know, you're, you, you got a little something to contribute. This way you can look at other people and you can know I'm a little better than they are. I've done a little more. I've worked a little harder, given a little more, been gone a little farther. You know, this, this way, this kind of a religion, at, you know, you can feel like you've, you've done a little something, feel like you've contributed a little bit, see? Look in your notes. People much prefer a compromi- compromised religion where God does a little and I do a little. I can still have some pride in that kind of religion. I can still compare myself to others. I can try and impress God. But to admit that all of my efforts are worthless, that exposes us for the empty frauds that we are. you got to hear Paul now. you got to hear Paul. Because Paul, Paul's message is so powerful. Because Paul does not say this. Paul doesn't say, look, you know, uh, the gospel of do is good, but the gospel of done is better. Paul doesn't say that. He's not like a salesman who says, you know, uh, tries to be uh, uh, correct and says, uh, you know, the other guy's cars are good, but our cars are better. Paul doesn't say that. Paul says this gospel of do, this gospel of works, is absolutely worthless. It's not like it's, 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 it's a, a kind of good, but what we have is better. He says, it is worth nothing. Listen, this is not the kind of talk that wins friends and influences people. See, when I talk like that, I want to make everybody feel good. Oh, okay, what you do is good, and what I do is good. You know, as long as we're all good, everything's good. Paul says, it's not good. He says it's a total compromise and a rejection of what Jesus Christ did did on the cross. It steals the glory of God, he says, and it's not good. It's not good. See, Paul, Paul is saying, I have nothing to prove anymore to anybody. 
He says, I, I can only boast in what Jesus Christ did at the cross. He says, I have nothing else to boast about anymore. He says, as, as a matter of fact, once I understood the cross, he said, the world had nothing to offer me. Once I understood the cross. Why, why does he say that? Once I understood the cross, the world has nothing to offer me. Why does he say that? Why? Because he knew that all the knowledge of the universities, all of the wealth of the great businesses, all of the gold medals of the Olympic accomplishments, all the medals and, uh, for heroic deeds, all the applause for great performances, all the pomp of royalty, none of it could do anything that which is so impressive to our eyes, none of it could do anything to save a man. None of it could do anything to save a man. And he said, the, I'm not impressed anymore. I'm not impressed. And he says, not only am I not impressed, he says, I'm not concerned about impressing anymore. Because when I wanted to impress it was because I wanted you to think more of me. But now that I've seen the cross of Christ, I realize that you, you have nothing to offer me. I am approved of God. God has declared me righteous. He has declared me holy. I stand before God as a saint. He says, I suddenly realized I didn't have to impress anybody anymore. I just was loved by God, and all I wanted to do was love him. And I wanted to love him by loving other people. I wanted to love him by, 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 by doing his will. I wanted to love him by doing the things he wants me to do. But I only do it because he first loved me. He says, I'm not impressed anymore with the world because the wisdom of this world never knew and never understood the cross. And he says, he says and, and, and I'm not worried about impressing anybody anymore because I've already been totally, completely accepted in the love of God. Totally, completely accepted in the love of God. Totally accepted. Completely secure in the love of God. It will never ever get any better than it is right now. God has done it all. He's given you everything you need. Everything you need. He who spared not his own son, will he not freely give you all things? Will he not freely give you all things? God is on your side. He's taken up residence inside of you. He's going to complete the work that he has begun in you. But there has to be a moment where you identify with Paul and you give up on yourself. Give up on trying to impress the world. Give up that if you just tried a little harder, you'll be good enough. You got to give up and you got to you, you got to just totally say, I just totally trust and depend on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. Now, you may be sitting here, you may say, well, I've done that, Pastor Mike. Years ago, I, I, I prayed and I asked Jesus to come into my life. And, you know, now I'm a Christian, I'm walking with the Lord. Well, you may have done that, sure, years ago. But like the Galatians, you may foolishly have shifted from the gospel of done to the gospel of do. And so what I want to ask you right now is would you again completely rest in what Jesus Christ has done for you at the cross? Would you totally give up on the whole idea that somehow you could be good enough? That, that if you just worked a little harder, you'd be that good little Christian, you could somehow win God's approval and just simply receive the fact that right now you are totally approved of God. He is totally committed to finishing the work he has begun inside of you. That he has taken up residence inside of you. It's no longer you that lives. It's Christ that lives in you. And the life that you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. And give up trying to impress a world that never even understood or saw 
they never they they didn't even conceive of what God was going God was doing. Just give up on it. They have nothing to offer you. And God has already given you everything He can offer you. Everything. You are accepted. You are received. Stand up, would you, right now? And if you're here today and want to just simply freshly take your stand upon the cross of Jesus Christ, that your total reliance is on the cross, there's nothing else, that you just would lift your hands right now. Would you do that? By doing this, you're saying, I'm not trusting in my abilities. I'm not trusting in my talents. I'm not even trusting in the gifts that God himself has given me. I I am right now absolutely recognizing that I am completely hopeless and helpless. That in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And yet somehow, mysteriously, God has loved me so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. And I am resting completely in that. I have nothing else to offer. I have nothing to contribute. If, if I, 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 when that day comes and I finally pass into the Lord's presence, all I'll be able to do is say, Jesus did it for me. I have nothing to offer you. All my whole life has been lived in a response to that love act that Jesus gave, but, but all of it added together would not even make a dent. It doesn't even compare to the greatness of what Jesus Christ did for me. My sin being forgiven. Lord, I'm trusting and resting in you alone. I'm trusting and resting in you alone. Lord, I just ask by the power of your Holy Spirit right now, you'll make the gospel so real to us, so real to us, Lord. The wonder of what you've done for us at the cross, make it so real to us. There's nothing we can do but rest, be at peace. We thank you for it now.